Okay. Hello, everybody. This is Geli Asafsky speaking. Welcome. I know tonight it's, it's a difficult subject that we're going to be addressing. My hope here today as a first responder is to help all of you have a baseline of how to start even understanding what happened today and also to be able to learn how to talk to your children, your families about what's going on. So we'll just take a couple of minutes. I see people coming on on my screen, on my phone, on Zoom, and on Facebook, just streaming everywhere to be able to get this information out to as many people as possible. Before I hit record, I just want to say that this thing tonight, we are not going to discuss whether the allegations are true or whether they're not true. I'm not going to get into that. I am here to help make a difference. That's what Parenting with Gelly is all about. That's what playful parenting is all about. If we want our homes to be places that are fun, carefree, happy, mothers that are connected and wanting to be there for our children to raise beautiful families, us mothers need to be able to have the tools and tips both to create the family atmosphere and also when real life happens, when tragedy happens, we want to make sure that we're there to support our children. That's what this is about. I'll introduce myself first because some of you may actually not know who I am. I know the Zoom link went around, uh, different links went around to people. So let me tell you a little bit about myself as more people are coming on. I'm Geli Asafsky. I'm a child and family therapist in Muncie, New York. I've been practicing now for 20 years. I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother of two cutie pies. I always say that's my claim to fame. And I also do a lot of work with children and families in the community. So some of the work I do, it's as a registered play therapy supervisor. I do a lot of play therapy. I supervise therapists who are learning how to do play therapy and as an EMDR certified therapist and an EMDR approved consultant, I supervise therapists who are implementing EMDR, which is trauma therapy, into their practices, both with children, with teenagers and with adults. Um, and many of you may know about my telecourse, which is Playful Parenting. And I'm proud to announce that we're actually going to be starting a Yiddish uh, telecourse for mothers who prefer to take a course in Yiddish. And that will be uh, starting January 17th during the morning. And I'm also proud to announce, because this is big, I'm not a nighttime person, I will be doing an evening telecourse for mothers that don't, you know, work during the day or it doesn't work out for them. That will also be starting January 17th. Uh, and if you'd like more information about that, feel free to reach out to me. And the number to learn more and to get information is 929-992-4453. That's 929-99-CHILD. Um, okay. So let's get started about why I'm doing this. The reason why I'm doing this is because I actually coordinate our local EMDR trauma response team in Rockland County in Muncie, where we provide pro bono free EMDR therapy in times of community crisis, natural disasters, hate crimes, terrorism, uh, and this is part of my mission that when bad things happen, that we show up and provide the skills that we need to be able to continue. When bad things happen, and I could speak for myself, my whole day went upside down. I heard about this in the morning. It was, it was like a bomb on my head. And I, and I have lots of skills at my disposal to be able to process complicated things. But these are the kind of things we're not accustomed to managing. It's way out of our, what I call, window of tolerance. We have no ability to figure out 
how to even make sense out of this. And that's what I hope to help you with today. I hope to help give you tools so that right here we can do something experientially, actually. The way I'm going to teach it is going to be in a way I decided where you can do it alongside me. And as we go along, and if you have a pen and paper, you can jot things down. And then when you go home, you'll know how to do this with your children. This is not therapy. This is what I call psychological first aid. So before we get into that, what I want to say, I'm just going to take a drink of water. I said a bracha before. Before I get into that, I want to talk about why we're on today. And I will hit record as soon as I'm done talking about it, because the issue of trauma is not just about suicide. It's not just about when you hear about somebody who is a popular author who committed suicide when there were multiple sexual abuse allegations against them. It's a terrible, terrible terrible story. And, uh, and the story is just, it's a real recording story. In progress. Okay, the recording just went on. R discussing the Chaim Walder suicide and its implications for people who love their books. My kids loved his books. Every time we bought a book, that was what they wanted. And to get this feeling like, one minute, this author who we were reading his books, this is what they're saying about him? One minute, he killed himself this morning? What's going on here, right? And that's what I said. Whether you believe it or don't believe it, I'm not here to discuss that. Children are coming home, young children, teenagers. We live in a world where even if you don't talk to your kids, they know more than you sometimes, right? It's insane. And that's why we need to be educated. That's why we need to know how to talk to our children. So I thought a lot during the day. I said, what am I going to talk about about suicide? You, could, you, you know, you could talk about a lot of things about suicide. But what do we tell ourselves to help ourselves make sense of it? And what do we tell our children? And I boiled it down to two things. I'm super practical by nature. So therefore, I don't want to overwhelm you just as much as I don't want to be overwhelmed. Number one thing you tell your children, if you did something bad and you're ashamed of what you did, you will not be hurt for coming to tell mommy, for coming to tell Tati. We are here to support you no matter what you did. It could be the worst thing in the world. We will get you help and we will take care of you. Never go it alone. Very, very important message to give our children. Our children need to know that. We're living in a world where so many crazy things are happening a child can feel ashamed. They can hold something in their hearts. They can ruin their childhoods when they feel like no one cares about them. So we need to give them this message loud and clear. And because everybody's talking about this, there's no better time than now. The time is now to tell your children, no matter what you have done, Nothing will happen if you come talk to me. Nothing. And number two, there is nothing in the world that is worth killing yourself over. If you're not muted, just do me a favor and mute yourself. I don't know if this is my, like a background thing. I, I see somebody. I need to mute you. I don't know how to mute you. Okay. I think I muted you. I'm not sure. Okay. Let's see if that issue comes up. If someone hears a little background, just let me know. Okay. So, yes. So someone's saying thank you. We need to hear this. It's so important to discuss this with our children to say when someone kills themselves, it's because they lost hope. 
It's because they didn't know what was what to do. And there is never a time when you're losing hope. There's even if you lost hope in the last minute of life, Hashem is there to forgive us human beings. Well, we need to work on things, you know, and and. Uh, that's why we have Rabbanim. That's why we have Das Taira. That's why there's something called Shuva. There is never a time where you should feel that the world is so bad that you need to kill yourself to give that message to your parents. Our the parents should be here no matter what is going on for your child across the board from a little child to a a a nine ten year old to a fifteen year old to a nineteen year old we've had so much tragedy happen there's been so many crazy stories in the past few weeks and i i today was just the 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 topping you can't say the icing on the cake because it wasn't a cake but that's the expression it's like in Yiddish, they, there's a saying, "Vifel can vifel is the shear." What is the shear? What? How much could a person handle? And that's where we are right now. Um, so I just want to make sure you got this. Two things: don't overwhelm your child. If you have a problem, you can always come to your parents. Number two. Nothing is worth killing yourself over. Nothing. Someone is saying something. Nothing is worth. It is, it's not something that you even should entertain. Family is a place that should be a place of resilience to hold our children, to keep them close to our hearts, to love them and embrace them. Okay. So with that being said, we are going to go into the educational part of this webinar, of this Zoom meeting, of this Instagram Live, Facebook Live, wherever you're watching. We are going to learn skills. Now, if you have a pen and paper, that would be great because then you could write some notes for yourself. So when you get off, you could talk to your kids and you, you don't have to like go back like, do I remember this? Um, and you may want to go back and that's okay, but we're going to have what's called a protocol. This is an EMDR protocol. I'm modifying it because I am not sitting in front of you. I don't see you, but I'm going to give you the pieces that I use when I walk into a stranger's house, when I work into a crisis and I say, hello, my name is Gelia Yasafsky. What's your name? I'm here to help. That's what we're doing right now. So the step number one, there are multiple steps. So let's start with step number one. And what I'm going to do is at a certain point, I'm going to say, if you have the option to put a comment, then put something in the comments or in the chat box. And what I'm going to do is try to open a third device to see if I could read comments on something else. So we'll take a minute and let's see if uh, we can do that as well. Hold on. And here, let's see if I can do this. I'm on here. Is my live video screen? Am I live? I'm not sure. If you don't have the ability Uh, If I don't have the ability to see your comments, I will go after this meeting and I will go back to the comments. Okay, so here's my sheet of paper. This is what I typically use when I walk into a situation with a group. This is used for group trauma. This is used also, I've adapted it to work with, uh, with families who are going through trauma as well. So step number one, what we want to talk about is present safety. Before we talk about something that is very, very difficult, we want to set the foundation for the brain to be able to handle something that's really, really difficult. Okay? We want to make sure that our brain has the ability to withstand, to have the resilience to manage 
the discussion that we're having. So we are going to talk about present safety. So I want all of you right now to just assess for yourself, zero to 10, zero, this doesn't bother me at all. One or two, you know, I misplaced my socks in the morning. Five, it's the midpoint, I would say 50%. And 10, it's I'm at the end. I cannot. You know, when you're going 12, you're like 150, 1,000. So if you want to put it in the comments or in the chat on Zoom, you can let me know how you feel right now when you think about what you heard today about the suicide that we're dealing with right now. Okay, and I am going to... Just look at the chats here. Um, okay, so someone is saying this, and I just want to call to this. This point made me wonder a lot how to explain this. If such a person did this, he was a role model for sharing emotions. How to tell them that nothing is worse than killing yourself and harming yourself. So really the answer is there is an assayan. There's uh, someone fell into a trap. We all have a Sahara. We all feel lonely just because we are an author, just because we're accomplished. That doesn't mean that we are actually, actually um, okay. Someone's saying it's very choppy. Is it still choppy? Um, trying to make sure. I feel like it's okay right now. If it becomes choppy again, let me know. Sometimes we're in a place where our brains take a hold of ourselves and we lose the ability to rationalize and to think clearly. That's what human beings are about. And I always use myself as a role model. And that's why I'm being honest with you. I was severely overwhelmed today. I really, I felt there was a brick on my head in my heart, I felt like one minute I had taken on that, and this is what I do, I show up at times of crisis, and how was I going to manage this? How was I going to deal with this? How was I going to show up for people when it was so hard for me? I mean, this is personal, right? It's impacting all of us. And then I realized that I just had to track my emotions. And that's something I teach my clients. So I feel sad. I feel overwhelmed. I feel mad. I feel lost. I feel confused. People can feel overwhelmed. People can feel out of control. People could feel lost and make decisions that don't make sense. And we, we're not in the mind of Chaim Walder, so we just don't know. But one of the things we do know is what he did. And sadly, that's what happens with suicide, is that it's a terrible legacy to leave. Because you leave the people behind really, really struggling. And that's just so, so, so painful. Okay, so I'm seeing some tens. I'm seeing... A, a seven. Um, yeah, this is kind of, this is the way, by the way, I get to hear and, and have a connection with you. So I know where you're at as you're listening to me. So what we want to do when we're at this high level of activation, we're feeling so overwhelmed, you and me both. And I can say that sometimes I feel like I'm at a seven and sometimes I feel like I'm at a 10 or a 20. It's that much. So let's start with what we're going to do to talk about present safety. So the person who's coming on live and trying to connect to audio, you are creating a choppy, your situation is creating a choppy sound. So what I would recommend is you get off and try to enter again because it's just a couple of minutes. Zoom can be that way sometimes. What I want you to do is we call this safe place. It's a safe place exercise. Somewhere where you feel safe in your life right now. For some people, the word safety feels very threatening. This is too triggering. There's no safety. 
So what we're going to do is ask you to think of a place where you feel safe enough. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'll give you a couple of examples. Please disconnect from the audio and come back into the Zoom room so that it doesn't get choppy. Thank you. So that way we can start figuring out what makes us feel safe. So for many people, children, teenagers, adults, your bed is a place where you feel safe. Sitting on the couch, reading a book, feel safe. Sitting with your children at the supper table surrounded by your family. I'm listening to us here. Um, I don't, one second, this is not working. Um, this is how you feel safe. I'm just double checking to see that I muted everybody. Okay. I see. I got it. I think we're good now. Okay. Sorry about that. So... I want you to think what makes you feel safe or safe enough. Sometimes we think of a vacation that we were at and that makes brings back that feeling of safety. For some people, it's what makes you feel calm, right? So I'll ask all of you, what makes you feel calm? Many people say, okay, when I'm baking, I feel calm. When I'm sending left, when I'm lighting candles, then uh, for Shabbos, then that brings me a lot of calm. When I'm reading, when I my kids are tucked in at night, the doors closed, the alarm is on, the windows are shut, the lock is done, then I feel safe, I feel calm. Some people find calm in a swimming pool, okay? Feel free to drop in the chat or the comments things that make you feel safe, safe enough, and calm. We also can think of what makes us feel happy. So I'm going to ask all you, think about yourself, think about your kids. Well, kids make me happy. If I ever need a pick-me-up, I just go to my grandkids and I'm like, they are so yummy. They make me feel so, so happy. So that, that does it for me. Sometimes it's meeting a friend that makes you feel happy. Sometimes it's that special event you were looking forward to or a hobby you enjoy. You like playing music. You like to draw. Playing a game with your children. Things that make us feel happy. And if all else fails... Something you're proud of. What are you proud of in your life? What is something that you accomplished that is a grounding force for you? Something that makes you feel solid. So for me, what grounds me, and I can say that something I'm proud of, is being a good mommy, being a good Bobby. Something that I'm proud of is that I keep working to bring the best therapy possible, cutting edge science to the from community, to anyone I can help. And I can really hold on to that. It's something I'm proud of. A child may be proud of riding a bike. They may be proud of uh, drawing, being good at chess, building their magnet tiles. Everybody has something they're proud of. So I'd like to ask you, just take a minute and pop into the Zoom comments or the uh, comments on the Instagram feed. Somehow I haven't been able to connect to the Facebook feed. I'm, I'm really not techie at this. I'm not a big, <laughs> I'm not big into all of this stuff. So I've tried my best, but I'll come back and read the comments below. What makes you feel? A, safe enough, I'm repeating this so you can write it down. What makes you feel safe? Safe enough if you're not feeling safe in the world. B, what makes you feel calm? C, what makes you feel happy? And D, what are you proud of? The same thing that we're doing right now, 
This is what you can do with your children. The modification, and I do this with adults and children, is that you can draw what makes you feel calm, what makes you feel happy, what makes you feel safe, what makes you, what you're proud of. Mommy can draw it, Tati can draw it, kids can draw it, little kids, big kids, teenagers. If they don't want to, they don't have to. What is the youngest age you would do this with? Um, sitting at the ocean, sometimes, someone just wrote, yes, I love that one. I love the idea of sitting at the beach nice and early in the morning. No one's there. It's just me watching sunrise. It's, it's amazing. That, that makes me feel calm right now. Thank you for that. So you can do this one-on-one -on -one probably with a little child that even can't draw, that scribbles. Okay, if they've heard this and they're stressed out, and I have heard young kids getting really stressed out, three-year-olds, and they're like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What's everyone upset about? So we need to discuss. We need to bring it down to their level. Again, don't take this as therapy because this is educational. So if you ask me questions, I can try to do what I can but again, these are broad recommendations and they're not specific to your family. Okay, so think about it right now and see where you were even five minutes ago, that seven, that 10, that overwhelm, thinking about what makes you feel calm, thinking about what makes you feel happy, what makes you feel safe or safe enough. And what you're proud of, does that drop the level of distress that you're in right now? And I'm going to tune in for myself. So I'm going to give you all just 30 seconds to a minute. Just take some time. Really tune in to yourself. And let's think, well, how is that working for me right in this moment? Okay, let's take another 20 seconds and I'm monitoring myself. Okay, so if you want to pop it in the chat, you can pop in what the number of distress you're at right now. Zero doesn't bother you at all. Five is our midpoint. Ten is the max. I would say that I went down from a 10 to actually a six, which is pretty incredible because I've been working on this all day long, okay? And even me, the expert in this, couldn't help myself. Here, we're doing this as a group together and I'm sitting here and I'm going, I could help myself, but I went up, I went down, I went around, and that's actually normal. But in the moment, right? In the moment doing this, and I see somebody posted here, absolutely went down to a six or a seven because it gives you a sense, a foundation to hold on to. So this is the first hook that your brain needs, and this is the first hook your family's brain needs, is to have a conversation about something that's really bothering, something that's traumatic. We first need to think about something positive. So it could be as simple with the young child, say something nice about that you like. So when I walk into a family setting and way before we even get to this, I say, hi, I'm Gillian. I like little kids. I like Mayer. I like my grandson and Layla, my granddaughter. And I'll go around and hear, so you like ice cream? Oh, that's nice. You like rabbits? Oh, that's nice. So be creative in terms of how we're going to talk about this. Whenever you talk about something difficult, you want to first talk about something that gives comfort to a person's heart and their minds. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take step one, put it on the side, and now we're going to go to step two. Step two is the difficult event, the traumatic event. 
And notice I am stopping to talk about the word suicide. I'm stopping to talk about the word sexual abuse. I'm talking about the bad thing that happened. We need to start deactivating the brain a little bit here. This was a terrible thing that happened. When did it happen? It happened in the morning. Is it over? He died. It's over. We're left to deal with that. But it's actually not happening right now. The after effect is happening right now. That's what we're dealing with. So with little children, even 8, 9 year old, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You have a 15 year old that's cooperative and joins around the table. Wonderful. If not, it's a conversation. Okay. And we're going to, what is the image that you have in your mind of this bad thing that happened? So if you have a pen and paper, you can actually right now in this moment, draw the image that comes to your mind about this bad story that happened this morning. You can also write uh, like a headline, like the beginning of a book. What is the headline to this picture? You need to give your brain words, right? So in my brain, I'm thinking about it right now, and I've been grappling with this because there's so many elements to this bad story, and it's coming on top of other bad stories. So I think for my brain right now, I'm going to write the bad ending. That is going to be the title for the file in my brain, about this bad story. So, I'm not drawing right now, but, and I actually could if I find a pen here. Um, yeah, I can draw. So all of you, we can all do this together. Just draw what this bad story looks like. And again, we are going to rate right now. You drew it, you put a headline, how much does it bother you right now? We're going back to this bad story after we finally established some calm. Do you find that the trauma starts feeling activated again? And it's going up, 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 up. If you do, then that is actually normal. What happens is we're establishing a baseline of safety. Uh, yeah. And then we're activating so it goes back up, but now we learn. We can make ourselves feel better when we think about what makes us feel safe, safe enough, calm, something that makes us happy, something we're proud of. And then we think about what makes us feel bad, and then we may need to shift back to what makes us feel good. So this is something that's important to learn because you will go through ups and downs, and you do have the ability, actually, to start um, taking care of this. You do have some baseline skill. I've taught it to you right now. So when it happens again and we're off this call, then you have the ability to help yourself. Okay? So that's step two. Step one, create the safety. Step two, let's talk about the past event that was bad, that bad story. Step number three is what we like to call the past resource. You don't have to call it that. I will explain right now what resourcing actually means. Resourcing, if we take it back to its basic element, what is a natural resource? Something we can't live without. We can't live without um, clean water. Can we live without clean water? That would be really bad. I think. Uh, how about fresh air? We need fresh air to live. Otherwise, we can have a lot of disease. What about, do we need heat in the winter? Do we need air conditioning in the summer, a fan, something to cool us down? I'm trying to give you the idea of something that we need that to hold us up. We need it to help us manage our daily living. So when it comes to to trauma and to bad things that have happened, what we need is a resource. 
something, something to hold on to. Something from the past, something from the present, something to ground us and make us feel like we could actually go on. As crazy as this bad thing is, where are we going to pull the strength from to continue? Just like in the olden times, they went to the river and they, they got the pail and they took out the water if they wanted to drink. Where are we going to go to get the strength to go on after this bad thing? Sorry, um, somebody again is... One minute. Somebody again, if you're not muted, please, uh, let me see if I can mute people. Okay, so I, let me try again. Let me see if there's anybody else I need to mute as people are coming in. I'm sorry about that. Please be patient with me, learning as we go. Okay, I think, let me see who's in the waiting room. We've got to admit people and please mute yourself as you come in. I muted myself, I'm back on. If you're calling on the phone, I need you to mute yourself because Zoom is not automatically muting you. Okay. Ah, I see a sign, mute all. Baruch Hashem. Okay. So I am muting all of you so that we shouldn't have this problem again. Okay. So I'm going to give you a couple of suggestions here for how to develop a resource. Okay. There are many people here. I'm streaming live on many different places. So for all of you, you're going to have different experiences. So let's start with a baseline. Excuse me. Let's say many people who I work with, they'll feel a baseline resource, somebody that they know in their neighborhood, in their family, grandparents who went through the Holocaust, uh, World War II, um, Somebody who broke a foot and it, it was so hard to get over it. Somebody that struggled with an illness. Somebody that struggled with sexual abuse and found a way forward, forged a new life despite all the odds. For some people, real life stories, it's hard. It's hard to just access that. It doesn't have enough grounding for them. And that's okay, because I always say we need multiple resources. So I would say at that point, we need to look, some people look to books. Some people look to, um, to in the Torah, Navi, Tehillim. Some people look to, I actually had some teenagers, they said they watched the, uh, the video, what was it called? Um, I am forgetting now something about a man that went through uh, tremendous odds, tremendous illness. Was it a book or a video or a movie? Um, so there, there are, there are sources where you learn, you take in from that person's resilience, that person's strength, music. Uh, thank you for that. Different things that give you foundationally, they give you a resource. That's what we want. And I'm explaining it on the adult level, and then we're going to go down to the kid level, okay? So another thing, many um, think about David HaMelech, and I'm saying it in English because there are lots of people watching here. King David, the Psalms, okay? I want everybody to be able to understand. Um, any, any resource that you can find in your world, that can really, oh, thank you. Somebody gave it to me. Aaron Margalit, as long as I live. I can't begin to tell you how many people have used this as a resource to help them when they felt like the earth was opening out from underneath them. 
And they found this author to be something that helped them carry through. Okay. For children, again, we're talking about young children. Um, resources could be something they learned in the Parsha. Um, it could be something they learned in the story of the week in the Bible. Okay. It can be something that they learned in a book that they read, a character that they love. It can be the next door neighbor, the grandmother that bakes cookies. She's forever baking cookies. She's always there. We can always count on her. Do you want to know something? One of my earliest childhood memories is going to my dear Tante Cyril. Um, they, they were childless. They were an older couple. And they lived about a five-minute walk from my house. And whenever I wanted a lollipop or a, a snack bag, I was... I'm the third of 12 children, so I knew where to go, and I wanted attention, one-on-one -on -one attention, right? So I'd go there, and they'd beam at me, and my uncle was busy planting carrots and cabbage and cucumbers, and it was such a nice, wonderful feeling, and I wonder why I'm pulling that up right now. I haven't thought about it in a very long time, but that's a resource. These people that went through the Holocaust, they rebuilt their lives and they were there they went strong and i could literally feel that strength in my bones as i speak so if you have any resources that you would like to pop into the chat into the comments go ahead we can all share with each other resources that help us so children's resources can be very simple it can be mommy actually always being home and making supper Mommy's the one that bathes me every day. I come home at night when the door is locked and everybody's home. That's my resource. That makes me feel yummy and safe. An older child, maybe it's some a story that they heard locally of someone who went through a hard time, like I mentioned, somebody who broke their foot, a teacher who is zooming around on one of those thingies and uh, schlepping themselves up the stairs when they broke a foot. You know what it takes to get out to, to teach in the morning and uh, get into your car, get onto the bus, get into school and have, what are they called? These little, um, these little, since COVID, I don't always have the, my recall correctly. Um, those little thingies that you go on and you put your foot on. If you can't help, you be more mobile. Anyway. So that's a lot of resilience, right? Some people think about, um, I've heard this recently, um, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, who was thrown into the wood in that little basket, but he was saved. The scooter, thank you for rescuing me. I, you know, I, I can't make believe this is it. I'm living, I'm doing my own resiliency factor. I show up even though I still have uh, a hard time every now and then. It's better than it was since COVID with word recall, okay? Um, the scooter. It's hard to get around on that scooter. Ever saw somebody doing that? Wow, it's hard. Okay? The stories from the Torah, the stories from the Bible that give us messages that tell us, wow, these people went through a hard time thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago and look who they became. We can borrow on their strength. We can tap into their strength. That's what we want to do. And on every age and stage, this will be different. But it's a hook to help your brain think like, oh, we're not all going down. We're actually, we're here. We, the, 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 the floor underneath us has not fallen apart. Like everything looks the same outside. But in our minds, we feel like it's all unhinged. So that's what we're doing. We're giving the brain information, resources, safety to feel grounded and supported as we deal, as we struggle with this bad thing. Okay, so we have the three steps down before I go to number four. Your present safety, happy, calm, what you're proud of. Number two, the bad thing that happened. Number three, your resource, draw your resource. Have it, literally, this is our resource. This is, and we'll talk about it. And that's the conversation that we're starting to have in our families, okay? 
Now we're going on to step number four, which is our desired future. A lot of times when we're going through something so bad, our brains feel like it's over. Everything's over. It's so chaotic. How are we ever going to move from here? How are we ever going to continue? So we need to remember that now is not permanent. It feels that way, but actually tomorrow's going to happen. The sun has always risen in the morning and the sunset has always happened. So tomorrow will happen, then the next day will happen, and then the following day will happen. So life continues. It's very hard to, to think about this. It's hard for me, right? Let's be real. So I want to share with you, there are, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are about eight basic statements from research that tell us what people in very difficult situations, earthquakes, natural disasters, school shootings, crazy things, right? We should never be tested, but here we are. We're, we're, we're talking about something that's impacting so, so many people. We need to believe there are eight things that people want to believe about themselves now and in the future. And I will share these eight things with you because... Even if we don't believe it right now, we can work to wanting to believe it in the future. We have to grab on to hope. That's what we need to do. Otherwise, our worlds will fall apart. What's going to happen to our children, our families? So we need to create the foundation to help us. The safety, yeah, the bad thing, the resources, and what we want to believe about the future. So I'm going to go through it. If you want to write these down, go ahead and we'll take it one step at a time. Do you, I'll ask you the question. Do you want to believe that it happened and it's over? At a baseline. Do you want to believe it? Even if you don't believe it right now, do you want to believe it in the future? And I have people check it off. So it actually is over. And I said that before, but it's not over in our hearts and in our minds. But do you want to believe that it happened and it's over? Number two, do you want to believe that I am safe enough right now? Here, right now, in this very moment. That's something we need to talk to ourselves as parents and we need to talk to our children. We need to discuss with them what they want to believe because right now what they're believing isn't working. It's too hard. So many people reached out to me feeling lost, overwhelmed, triggered, chaotic. Their teenagers were taking sides. They didn't know what they were hearing, what they were reading, what they were seeing. Do you want to believe that you're safe enough right now? That's all. Our next one, number three is, do you want to believe that you can cope? So even if you feel like you're not coping right now, do you want to actually believe that you can cope down the road tomorrow when the sun comes up? Check that off if you want to believe that. Do you want to believe I can learn to choose how to respond? That's a very big one. Sometimes we feel like how we respond is not in our control. Like my head is spinning. My heart is spinning. Everything feels upside down. I feel like my head is on the floor and my feet are on top. It's, it's too much. It's too much. So do you want to believe that I can learn to choose how to respond to this bad thing that happened. Check that off. Even if you don't believe it right now, do you want to learn? Yes, we can. Do you want to believe, number five, I did what I could? And that's a tough one. I actually feel tears coming to my eyes and I feel kind of vulnerable, but I'm sharing that. I know you can't see it, but I'm sharing it because... For me as a therapist, this person was a therapist. If I would have known, 
What would I have done? Many times we hear stories as therapists, as human beings, and we know what we should do. We know we should say something. You know, if you see something, say something. And then we're like, eh, who's going to believe me? Or, eh, who am I? I did. Do you want to believe I did what I could? Of course, I had no knowledge. I had no information. I bought those books. I thought it was amazing. Yeah, I did what I could. When I heard about the bad thing a few weeks ago, if you heard, I pulled those books off my kid's shelf. I didn't, like someone said to me, what do I do? My kid wants a book for Hanukkah. What should I say? We were struggling how to deal with this. I did what I could. If you want to believe it now, or if you want to believe it in the future, even if now it's hard to believe that, check that off. Six. And we're going through this. Not everyone will be relevant to you, but these are the research-based things that we talk to survivors and we say, do you want to believe this? Your brain needs hope. Your brain needs something to hold on to. Do you want to believe I survived? Right now it feels for many of us, and I've been busy all day with this, I'm not going to survive. I can't. I'm so triggered. It's too much. How am I going to sleep? How am I going to eat? How am I going to talk to my kids? Do you want to believe that when the sun comes up tomorrow, when you go to sleep tonight, in a few days from now, I survived? And we're going to learn lessons from this. I hope that something changes. I'm actually have a meeting tomorrow with uh, one of the directors of Magain which is um, an organization in Israel, in Eretz Yisrael, to talk to somebody about sexual abuse awareness, what they're doing. Is there something we could do in our neighborhoods to stop this craziness from continuing so I could know I did the best I could? That's, that's for me. So that I know tomorrow I survived this and actually... I'm going to go from surviving to thriving because I'm going to do something about it. Okay, number seven, do you want to believe I have strengths? Think about it. Now or tomorrow, we all have strengths. And number eight, do you want to believe I have hope? And I'm going to be cut off pretty soon, I see. And, and um, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. And if we need to do this again, I will do this again. We need to help each other here, to support each other, to help our families, to help ourselves. Do you want to believe that you have hope? I want to believe that. I really want to believe that. And I'm just, you know, there's always that other. I always want to say to myself, I want to believe that Hashem takes care of me. God takes care of me. Whatever I'm going through, Hashem takes care of me. I may not see it right now. I may feel so stressed out, so burdened, so overwhelmed, but Hashem takes care of me. If you want to believe that, tick off the box. So these are the four hooks that we are working on. Obviously, this is there's a lot more to this. I'm trying to give you the pieces to hold on to the safety, the bad thing, the resource, the desired future, so we can ground ourselves, so we can hold on strong, so we can continue. And the last thing I wanna share with you is when you think of bad things, this is actually called a butterfly hug because you go like this. And EMDR is based on the fact that right, left, right, left, right, left, tapping, and we don't have the time to get in the science. This is not what EMDR is, so don't try to try it on yourself. But here I am just sharing something that the right, left, tapping, that can help your brain process bad things. So it's something that can help you, just it's soothing and calming. This does not mean that if you have a major problem, go and tap and it's going to go away. 
it can really backfire. I'm talking about this specific situation. If you're having a hard time tonight and you want to tap to calm yourself, go ahead and do that. Okay. I hope this has been really helpful, giving you a foundation, somewhere to begin, somewhere to start on the journey to getting clarity and to start feeling like you can go on. This is not a one-time event like, okay, now we're hanging up, it's going to be over. There are going to be multiple conversations. We have children of different ages and stages. We're going to try to take these and modify it to the different ages and stages and make sure you talk to your kids before they come home, having heard some funny story with multiple additions to the story as if it's not bad enough from somebody else. Okay? That's very, very, very important. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad it was super helpful. I hope you've taken some notes. I'm going to try and figure out how to save the Zoom. I still have to figure out how to do the Zoom thing. And um, thank you. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you for tools that we have to help ourselves when we go through a very challenging time. And thank you for coming on today and giving me the opportunity to be there to support you. I'm happy you came on. Please share this information with anybody you know so that we can help ourselves, we can help our communities, and we can help each other heal. Okay, um, I'm wishing you all the best. And if you have any questions, I'm trying to figure out if you're on live on social media, you know where to reach me. Um, if you're not on social media, um, a WhatsApp, text, uh, what's my Google number? Hold on. I don't even know my Google number. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, give me one minute, folks on Zoom who are on the phone line, and I will give you a Google number to reach out to, I, I don't know that I can respond to every single phone call, but if it's something you feel that you need direction, um, I think what I'm going to say is that I would like you to reach out to support systems in your community. That's what I'm going to ask because I myself cannot handle the phone calls. I don't have all the answers actually but reach out to people in your community. And if somebody in your community wants me to do Zoom with your school, with your Kehilla, with your community, they can reach out to me and uh, I will see what I could do to help in this time of need. Wishing you all a peaceful night and hopefully a better tomorrow. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.